the ocean and the land, they offset each other in such a great way. Because I'm able to go in the ocean, my time away from it is that much greater, and vice versa. It's one of those things that I can't imagine it not being here or being you know, at the level of quality in which it is for future generations. The interconnectedness between us and the ocean, the way it allows people to see deep within themselves and really understand where they come from and how we're all connected, it's just such a valuable resource to all of humankind. You know, we have to do good for it because it does good for us. We just can't lose it. The ocean is uh, something that I think we can all identify with, even if we're not living in coastal communities. It's one of the largest carbon sinks in the entire globe, and it just matters. Whether you're in a coastal community or you're in an inland community, the ocean is directly tied to each of us. Life on planet Earth as we know it would not exist if it weren't for the ocean. The vast expanse of blue makes up over 70% of the Earth's surface. The ocean is a place teeming with life, big and small, and has been a catalyst for the evolution of millions of different species. This is a story about many of these animals creatures who help balance the ocean's ecosystems, as well as the humans that fight to give these animals a voice. These are the keepers of the blue. The ocean is a beautiful place, a place that many people can acknowledge has major ecological importance throughout the entire world. But not many people know that you can find some of these amazing habitats right out your own front door. That's why today I'm going to be journeying up to Rhode Island to meet up with two of my family members, where we are going to be looking around at some of these beautiful New England habitats to find some amazing wildlife. You ready? I'm doing it. <laughs> so what do we got here? We're going to go see where Camp Cronin, Point Judith. This is open ocean here, so we're not in the bay. So you never know what could be in here. So hopefully if the water is clear, we should see a good amount. The whole question is, is it clear? Is it clear? Is it it's windy. If it's not, windy. we're on to the next spot. So we'll see. We have, a, we have a flag. So we have to go to areas where there could be boat traffic. You have that flowing around for safety. <laughs> The ocean is uh, limitless because I think it connects all life. The trek. <laughs> <laughs> and so anything in swimming in Hawaii or the Indian Ocean could possibly be here. I don't know, it's the interconnectedness with the world that I think is fascinating about the ocean, uh, no matter where you are. David Benoni and Craig Honeycutt have enjoyed the ocean for all of their lives. It serves as a place of exploration and connection to the environment, but also helps kindle an understanding of the unique connection between land and sea. Here in Block Island, Rhode Island, we are at the southern extent of the most recent ice age, the southern extent of where the glaciers sat put, and the technical term for that would be a terminal end moraine. The theory goes that the glaciers were half a mile thick, and the ice was churning, the water was running. It wasn't just white snow and ice. It was very muddy, mucky, brown, dirty, full of rocks and cobbles, as you can see all around you. This is all just the remains of what the glaciers left before they receded back. Block Island a landmass off the coast of the northeastern United States serves as a regular diving spot for thousands of locals. The island is part of the Outer Lands region, a coastal archipelago rich with reef and ocean life. Stingray, grass, and sea bass species propagate near this island.
But these aren't the only animals that enjoy these waters. Sharks are the product of millions of years of evolution, their bodies showcasing the perfect underwater predator. From the mighty whale shark, which reaches lengths of up to 60 feet, to the nurse shark, which averages seven. Sharks come in all shapes and sizes. Along the eastern portion of North America, sharks have been the subject for dozens of research groups. The Atlantic Shark Institute, founded by marine biologist John Dodd, serves as part of a network of scientific organizations throughout the eastern portion of the United States. I think one of the biggest disservices when you see some of the media that comes out is this portrayal that these sharks are bloodthirsty, that they see a human being and they're it's simply not the case. If you spend any time in the water, you understand these sharks are very cautious, very cautious, and they're very careful. Our favorite is the mako shark, um, and for a lot of reasons. First of all, it's the Porsche of the ocean. It's absolutely a gorgeous shark. Uh, number two is, I've heard it described once, as if you took a block of wood and you pushed it through the ocean for a million years, it would come out in the shape of a mako shark. It is the most hydrodynamic thing you'll find in the ocean today. Unfortunately for the shortfin mako, the shark has been subjected to relentless sport fishing, something that has led to its inclusion on the endangered species list. They don't reproduce until they're over 600 pounds. It takes them 20 years before they can reproduce, and they have few young. So when you understand it takes a long time for them to mature, they don't have a lot of young, and there's millions and tens of millions of hooks all over the ocean, it's not a good equation. A startling 100 million sharks are estimated to be killed each year. That means over 270,000 sharks are killed each day. More than 11,000 are killed in an hour and over 4,000 sharks will die in the time it takes to watch this film. When we see sharks, we know the environment is healthy. And when they're not there, it's not a balanced environment. It simply can't sustain itself. Organizations like the Atlantic Shark Institute serve as protectors of these ocean predators and help lend sharks a voice, leading to lasting conservation. But while it's easy to trust the words of those that work with the sharks every day, filmmaker Tomas Keck decided it would be best to view the most dramatized shark in the world up close. Hey, Professor, how are you? Hey, Tomas, how are things going? Things are going pretty good. So we arrived at the hotel. I'm overlooking a beautiful view right now. Essentially, today, we're going to be boarding the boat around 8 to 9 o'clock after our COVID tests. We're going to be taking about a day to get out to where we need to go to the island of Guadalupe. Once we're there, it's going to be sharking for the next three and a half days. So hopefully then we'll be getting some good footage. There you go. All right, well, all systems go. I wish you the best of luck and let's check in again soon. All right, sounds good. Thank you very take, much. Take care. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All systems are go. travel three and a half days of sharks so we'll, we'll have some fun and we'll try to get as much footage as we can and see if we can make this work make this happen so after a full day at sea we finally arrived at Guadalupe Island this huge rock that seems to just shoot up in the middle of the ocean is a beautiful spot and is one of the greatest places to find great white sharks on the planet. And I'm excited to see what we will be finding tomorrow as tomorrow starts our first day of sharking. 
and where we get to see, hopefully, the largest predatory shark up close. Welcome to Guadalupe Island, a volcanic island located 241 kilometers off the west coast of Mexico's Baja, California. Fortunately for us, the volcano which created this island has long been dormant. This remote paradise is home to a mysterious gathering spot for the largest predatory fish on the planet, the great white shark. Where we're at here is a really unique ecosystem. So there are sea lions here, there are amazing, we saw tuna swimming all around today, really vibrant with life. This is a, the Pacific population of white sharks, so it is different from New England. They got a lot of unique personalities that we don't really see uh, off of Cape Cod. So while the biologists on board looked through their records and the crew got the bait ready in preparation for the sharks, the anticipation grew. Seconds turned to minutes and minutes turned to hours. Then the first shark hit. Then it hit again. And it was finally time to get into the water. Underwater, I was faced with this beautiful blue abyss, surrounded by a variety of different fish species. And that's when I saw my first view of a great white shark underneath the waves. This massive fish can reach lengths of more than 20 feet long and is what inspired films such as Jaws. Rather unfairly, it has been labeled a bloodthirsty predator. While experts would not advise swimming with these apex predators, they are far from the aggressive and overzealous man-eaters the media representation would have you believe. Back in the 70s and early 80s, sport fishing for white sharks, specifically in the Northeast, have been popular. And this is due to movies like Jaws. People wanted to be like Quint and wanted to get the largest white shark out of the ocean. And some scientists do estimate that up to 80% of that population was actually taken out of our ecosystems at one point in time. When I got in the water, my aim was to take photos that show these sharks not in their crazy enraged state. I want to take photos of the sharks at their peaceful state, swimming through the beautiful blue water while all these fish swarmed around them. It's important that we as humans don't give in to the sensationalistic ideas that some people want in order to sell books, to sell toys, to sell movies. These sharks are animals too and they make up a great part in our ecosystem, an ecosystem that is in balance at all times and that need these sharks in order to fulfill that balance. Predators like sharks help moderate and balance an immense variety of aquatic habitats around the globe. These environments support vast ecosystems. Some of the most diverse marine and aquatic ecosystems on the planet occur here in the tropics. Florida is home to many of these environments. Salt springs offer an amazing clarity and habitat for freshwater creatures. Visibility often reaches out more than 100 feet. Farther toward the coast, within Everglades National Park, mangrove habitats border the coastline. This rich environment is where many birds, fish, and invertebrates make their home. When the reef fish spawn their offspring, 
migrate into Florida Bay to the seagrasses, to the mangroves, and that gives them an opportunity to kind of hide, start feeding, get bigger, and then they move out and gradually as they grow in size, they do this thing that scientists call an ontogenetic shift. When they get to a certain size, they move to a different habitat. Eventually, those fish end up back out on the reef. Mangroves offer spawning areas to numerous species of fish, and the rocky shore can harbor urchins, crabs, and other wildlife. Along this shore, an amazing array of activity occurs. The brown pelican is a large seabird and is one of the three pelican species found in the Americas. Along the shore, these birds gather in hunting groups and with their explosive aerial diving power, find and feed on fish in large quantities. Birds and fish are really interconnected. So all the way down um, from bait level prey fish up to incredible sporting fish, birds transport all sorts of different um, seeds and berries and um, nutrients that actually help to even do things like repopulate seagrass beds. But farther offshore, there resides another habitat, one that many would consider extraordinary. So here we are at the Florida Keys. This beautiful paradise is the tropical home for thousands upon thousands of different species of reef fish, invertebrates, sharks, you name it. We're going to be journeying offshore to Louis Key to try to find as many different species as possible and showcase all the great biodiversity that these reefs have to offer. Florida's coral reef stretches just short of 350 miles and is the only coral reef system in the continental United States. It's home to 80 species of coral. These coral are animals, not plants, and provide homes for millions of aquatic organisms. Parrotfish, barracuda, snapper, and even shark species make their home here making the coral reefs one of the most biodiverse habitats in the world. Unfortunately, these amazing environments are under threat. Our reef is not healthy. It's got a lot of diseases. You know, I think it really started to decline when the flow from the bay to the reef became somewhat toxic. We started having algal blooms and seagrass die-offs, and so the water that would then leave the bay and end up on the reef was not healthy water. You know, we've lost 90% or more of our live corals. As of 2021, NOAA has documented more disease outbreaks than ever. The reason for the rise in cases is unknown, but researchers are working hard to identify genotypes of corals that are resistant to disease. The water temperature is too high, so there's a, a global warming component involved. You know, coral have a very narrow range of temperatures, and if you start altering those things, they're very sensitive to it. For now, the future of these coral reefs is uncertain. No matter the coastline, the region, or the island, the ocean harbors organisms of major importance. From the intimidating great white to the beautiful coral, each animal adds to the balance of each extraordinary environment. But just as important are the scientists, advocates, and naturalists who work to protect these animals and ecosystems. Each individual helping spread the voice of the ocean, a voice that only they can hear. These are the people, animals, and everything in between that keep the ocean healthy. These are the keepers of the blue. Thank you.